The question is, how do I use this kind of a program with preschoolers? So when I'm thinking preschooler, I'm thinking like about three or four. Um, in my mind, a two-year-old is more of a toddler. Um, and so I'm thinking preschool is more like three and four. And I remember years ago as a, as a trainer, I used to tell people, don't talk to me about kids that are under five because we're just, we're just focusing on kindergarten and up. But you know, uh, I ran into a mom who had been using this program for a year with a four-year-old. When I met her, her daughter had just turned five, which means she'd been using it the entire time her daughter was four. And I was blown away by what this little four-year-old girl was able to do. I have seen now many, many little youngsters that are able to use the program and at as early as four. Uh, Three-year-olds can learn phonograms. So it's not that you can't do it with uh, the preschoolers. The question is how? How do I do it with a little one like that? So that's what I'm going to talk about today. All right, I'm going to talk today about what a child needs before the teaching reading process. What are the foundations that you need to have in place in order to be successful at using a program like Spell to Write and Read, or really any reading program? What are the before teaching reading? And then how can you work on those types of things? How can you prepare a child for the learning to read process? So there are three basic things that I want to talk about as far as the um, teaching reading process, what needs to be in place for a student to succeed at the teaching reading. And really, this is for any student, but we're specifically focusing on the preschool, three and four year olds at this time. So the first thing is language. A student needs to have language. Now you think, well, of course, I mean, yeah, but actually we don't think about that when we're thinking about teaching reading. We assume the child has language. I mean, after all, we talk to them, and they talk to us, usually. So what do you mean teach language? What, what do you mean language? What are you talking about there, Liz? So you have to understand that reading comprehension, actually understanding what we read, depends huge, is highly dependent on vocabulary. The child has to have vocabulary, and they have to understand the grammatical structure of the language and how the language works. Did you know that dyslexia is actually a language disorder? It's the inability to pull language out of the written text or the written code. And so a child needs to have good, strong language skills to be successful at learning to read. And so what, what do I mean by language? Well, when we think about language, by the way, my background is in speech and language pathology. So I kind of know a little bit about this, um, even though my uh, area that I work now is in teaching reading. But when you talk about language, we're talking about two different things. We have expressive language and we have receptive language. And, and that's kind of self-explanatory. Expressive language is what the child actually says. What is the child actually able to communicate verbally? Um, expressive language can be nonverbal as well. Um, but what is the child be able to communicate from what he or she wants to communicate? So that would be verbal, um, uh, I mean, sorry, vocabulary, the, the words that the child is able to use, the way that the child is able to put sentences together. Um, you know that uh, a, a one-year-old that's just developing language, uh, early two-year-old, they might be able to say, you know, cat, sit, mommy, mommy go. Well, what does that mean, mommy go? Well, as the child develops the expressive language, the child's actually able to say, mommy, I want to go with you. So notice the difference between mommy go and a whole full sentence, I want to go with you. So when we're dealing with babies, toddlers, we're having to do a lot of interpreting. But as the child grows in their expressive language, they're able to express more um, clearly what it is that they want to communicate. Then there's receptive language. And receptive language is the ability to understand what others are communicating. So uh, know that receptive language will probably usually exceed expressive. So children understand a lot more language 
then they're able to communicate themselves. So receptive language is understanding instructions, um, specific vocabulary. No, put it on top of the table rather than next to the table or under the table. Well, right there, I'm using prepositions. Does the child understand prepositions and what those mean? So that's what I mean by expressive and receptive language. I'm not talking about speech. Speech is uh, the ability to produce the words and the sounds that the child actually uses when they're when they're talking. So, for example, um, a two-year-old might say, you know, wa 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 wa, you know, instead of I want water, whereas maybe a four-year-old would be more clear in his speech. So, I'm not talking about speech, although speech is um, an issue that has to do with expressive language. But I'm talking about language, understanding words, understanding how we put words together. Um, if I say, I don't want that, that's different than if I say, I want that. So the child needs language skills. So um, how do you help your child build expressive language? Well, let them talk. Okay, you need to let them talk. Um, I know that in some families where you have multiple children, especially if your child is the, the one in question, the, the preschooler is the youngest, a lot of times older siblings like to talk for her or for him. And then he doesn't really get a chance to verbalize. You know, uh, big sister sees that little brother uh, is looking at the banana. She says, oh, Joey wants a banana. Well, Joey never gets a chance to say, hey, I'd like a banana because big sister is doing all the talking for him. So let the child talk. Um, you know, in order to have your child develop expressive language, he needs to have somebody listening to him. And I know that as moms, we can be uh, I'm assuming I'm talking to moms, we can be so busy and a uh, little one is talking and we're just kind of trying to get dinner on the table or, or trying to get our grocery list made up or, or trying to figure out what we need to do tomorrow for math with Big Brother and it's like, uh-huh, uh-huh. But we need to listen to them and give them eye contact and give them an audience for their developing language. And so let them talk, listen to them, um, Try to keep older siblings for talking from them. Give them a chance. Um, and, it, you know, with the technology today, they can actually talk to Grandma and Grandpa on FaceTime um, and know that they have a voice and they have something to say. So building their expressive language is important. We also want to build their receptive language. So when a child is learning to read, that is a form of receptive language. So in other words, somebody else is doing the communicating and they're trying to understand what the other person is communicating. With reading, that communication is happening through the written code. When we're talking to one another, it's an auditory, verbal um, type of a, an experience. But reading is also receptive language. It's just understanding the communication of somebody else but it's using a written code. So how do we build receptive language? Again, talk to them, have them listen to you. Um, you language is learned through interaction. This is, you know, a lot of times we see these movies where people sit in front of a TV for a week and they walk away and they're they're um, verbal. They they can speak the language, um, and, and that's not that's not the way it happens. You have to interact when you're learning a language. Um, so they need to interact with you. They need to understand basic vocabulary. Things like above, straight, over, under, next to, followed by, before, after, tall. These are all um, vocabulary words that a student that would be learning to read would need to understand, especially if you're teaching penmanship along with it. These are vocabulary words that need to be in the child's receptive language so that they can follow instructions when you're teaching reading and penmanship. There's other words. I actually have a handout. I will post it in the comments when I'm done here, and um, you'll be able to download this handout. It's um, a three-page handout that I have. It's on my website, and it's called Developmental Considerations and 
preparation. And it's actually, if you have the Curse of First book, it's a chapter in that book. It's a three-page handout. And again, I'll put the, the link to how you can find it on my website, and you can download it for yourself. And it lists there for you all these words that the child needs to be able to understand to be successful in the learning experience. Okay, a child also needs to be able to follow one and two-step instructions. So you might play games with them. So like, for example, what I mean by a one-step instruction is touch your toes, run to the door, pick up your socks, okay, um, jump three times. Now that's actually a two-step. Do you understand that? That has two components to it. So it's jump and then how many times. So the child has to be able to process those kinds of instructions and Again, these are skills that we assume that they have. We assume that a child can have that. And then we start sitting down and teaching them, and there's a problem, and they're not listening, or they're not paying attention, or they're not following instructions, and we think it's a behavioral issue, when in fact, it's a language issue. It's something that the child does not have. And so that's something that you could be working on as you're preparing the child for learning how to read. So play games with them where they follow instructions. Another example of two-step directions would be touch your toes and then your nose. So you've got two things for them to do. They're sequential. Can they pay attention to both of those and put them in the correct order? You might have a child that touches his nose and then bends down to touch the toes. Did he understand the instructions? A lot of times kids will pick up what you say last and not get what you said at the beginning. I remember as a camp counselor, we had a really big hill that was right by the dining hall, and the counselors would stand at the bottom of the, ha the hill as kids came running down, and every single meal, we had one kid that just took a nosedive down the hill, and then we'd have scraped knees and, and crying and all that kind of thing. And they would stand at the bottom of the hill, and they would say, don't run, don't run. What the kids heard was run. They didn't hear the don't. Okay, maybe there was too much noise, but what they heard was the last thing that was said was run. What you need to say instead is what you want the child to do, walk. So I would stand at the bottom of the hill and I'd sound like a chicken, walk, 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 walk. And they heard that. Then they would slow down and they would do what I said. So be aware that when you're giving instructions, a lot of times what happens is kids hear the last thing you said and they respond to that. So they need to learn to listen to sequential instructions. All right, uh, another thing they need to do is learn how to point to various parts of a piece of paper. Where's the top? Where's the bottom? Work on left to right. Do they know the difference between left and right? Now, a lot of times when we teach left and right, what we do is we say, this is your, this is my right, this is your left, but as my right, and this is my left. Okay, right, left, get it? Right, left, now don't get those mixed up. Well, yeah, the child's gonna get them mixed up. That's not the way you teach directionality. You teach one really, really well. You focus on one. Now, when I was working with my kids, what I did is I started with left. I know everybody in my household is right dominant, but I started with left. And the reason was I had them put the fork at the left place at the place to, at the setting when they were setting the table. So where does the fork go? Because almost every meal we had, we would use forks. So I would have my, my preschoolers set the table. Go put forks on the table. The fork goes on the left. And they would get really, really good at setting the table with a fork. And that's their job. And so week after week after week, they learned left because that's where the fork went. And I would say, the fork goes on the left. Put it on the left. And then I would introduce the spoon. And the spoon goes on the right. We, and by that time, maybe they were writing. And I say, you write with your right. And so the spoon goes on the right. But notice, I didn't introduce right until left was firmly established. So that's another thing, is directionality. Because obviously, when you're teaching English, English is left to right. And so we need to establish where is left. Now, if you're working with, I'm getting ahead of myself, teaching penmanship, but when you're teaching a right-handed student, they're going to use their left hand to anchor the paper. And so we start with our anchor and we move away from it. So we'll come back to that next time when we talk about teaching penmanship. Okay, so what's another way that we can develop receptive language in children? And that is through reading aloud to them. I cannot stress how important it is to be reading aloud to our kids 
every day develop a habit of reading aloud. Why do we want to do that? Well, like I said, it builds receptive language. Books tend to have better grammatical structure than a lot of our spoken language. A lot of times our language is kind of, um, it's, it's not that it's bad, it's just normal, everyday, uh, abbreviated English, and sometimes it might not be grammatically correct. Um, but you'll notice that when you're look, reading a book, that has correct grammatical structure. And so you're providing for your child um, correct grammar when you're reading from a book. Your uh, literature, when you're reading literature to a child, it also has a wonderful um, flow to it. Uh, it uses figurative language. It uses uh, great vocabulary. Uh, even books that are meant for children have really good vocabulary. So you're building good language skills. Also, when you're reading aloud to a child, you're planting the desire to read. You're showing the child that this is something valuable. It is inspiring future reading success. It stimulates their interest and it stimulates their language development and their attention span so they can focus for a longer period of time when they develop the habit of reading, of listening to you read aloud to them. It nourishes emotional development. So I, I will never forget the times that I got to sit with my little ones on the sofa and, and just read to them. And um, it teaches the reading process. So if you've got a little youngster that's sitting next to you while you're reading to them, slide your, your finger across the page and show them that these black and white squiggles that are on the paper, that's where I'm getting the words that I'm saying to you. And you know, kids get that. I have seen videos on Facebook of little bitty children who pick up a, a book. Uh, I saw one not long ago. It was a baby who picked up a book. I mean, no expressive language that you could comprehend, um, still developing language. And she was sliding her little finger across the page and going, blah, 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 blah and all kinds of expression because I'll bet you anything that kid's being read to. So um, according to the author of the Read Aloud Handbook, Jim Trelease, you can get that book, great book for you to have, get it at your local library. Um, according to Jim Trelease, reading aloud is in essence an advertisement for learning to read. So we want to be reading aloud, read aloud to our little ones and make it a habit every single day um, to be reading something to them. And you know, of course, they always want to hear the same books over and over. So if you don't have anything fresh, just pull out something that they've heard before and they will be thrilled.